Our next speaker is Yaroslav Lisavolik, who now works for as a chief economist for Eurasian Development Bank. And twice already during this discussion, we cited, I cited Zbigniew Brzezinski, you cited someone else, saying that who controls Eurasia probably is the key master of the geopolitics of the world. And uh, so we, we are very much interested. Are we going to be the leader of Eurasia or we are going to slide a little bit and one way, one belt, we just give it as a present to our Chinese friends? Well, I think uh, this is probably one of the big questions for the next uh, several decades, what the strategy of Russia will be in terms of structuring its alliances uh, internationally. And uh, actually, this was one of the points I wanted to raise uh, during my uh, intervention. But I do think uh, that, uh, as Mr. Fouché noted, uh, China is a big part of Russia's foreign economic policy strategy. Uh, in the coming decades, it's just there. It's already the largest trading partner if you take by country, obviously. Um, and um, yes, this is, uh, this is gonna be one of the um, uh, key issues uh, for Eurasia. I think um, uh, we're already seeing signs of competition, uh, hopefully creative competition, constructive competition between Russia and China. Uh, in Eurasia, in some parts of uh, Eurasia, in Central Asia, clearly the influence of China, economic presence of China has increased tremendously. But let, let me start, uh, before I come uh, back to some of these um, issues, let me start with a broader general observation uh, that uh, if there is one thing that we can be certain about with regard to Russia in the next uh, several decades, it is that Russia will um, attempt to stage uh, a catch-up effort. Um, and that effort will def definitely necessitate a certain strategy. And uh, the strategy that uh, dominated before um, seemed to be very simplistic, uh, seemed to be, well, clearly not very successful in the sense that it was largely dependent on the hope that uh, the West would deliver the goods, so to say. Um, and uh, the disillusionment uh, with regard to that vision uh, was uh, palpable, was striking in some ways in the past uh, several, uh, several years. Uh, some of the examples um, that I would bring in, Mr. Johnston uh, touched upon, um, uh, some of these issues, and I would say the WTO accession is, if there's one thing that could have been done better, I think, in the preceding decades, uh, it's that instead of Russia waiting at the door and seeing a lot of the CIS countries get into the WTO ahead of it, uh, waiting for 20 years, nearly 20 years, to get into the organization, um, uh, it would have been far better, um, of course, uh, if Russia was allowed to compete equally on equal terms at the outset in, uh, in the beginning of the 1990s. And obviously this is one of the uh, several um, issues that R Russians have with regard to the preceding uh, several decades. So accordingly, I think uh, there will be a strategy that to some degree will be based, will represent a contrast effect of sorts with regard to the experience of uh, Russia in the, in, in the past decades. And uh, I think one uh, part of the strategy that we're already starting to see to some degree is more emphasis on self-sufficiency, clearly the realization that uh, Gershenkron, Alexander Gershenkron, the economist who came up with the principle that there are advantages in backwardness and countries that are lagging will adopt technology and catch up quickly. Uh, that, that doesn't seem to work for, uh, for a lot of reasons and there needs to be uh, a more concerted effort to, um, to forge ahead with um, uh, modernization. So self-sufficiency, import substitution to some degree uh, may be a, a far bigger part of the economic strategy going forward. Um, I think uh, what is very interesting that you're, you're hearing in the domestic policy debates uh, as all of these economic plans are being devised by Kudrin, by Areshkin, by the government, et cetera, is the word nonlinear catch-up. 
uh, meaning that uh, if previously the vision was that, well, we adopt this or that technology step by step, we go through all of the necessary stages to all of the requirements, so to say, to, uh, uh, um, uh, to, to reach a certain level, um, now Russia is looking for shortcuts. And uh, some of these shortcuts may be uh, precisely represented by the, the new infatuation of President Putin, namely uh, the digital economy, the new economy. That seems to be, from what, what I understand, the topic of greatest interest for, uh, for the Russian president. And uh, in terms of um, the, the model that uh, Russia is going to emulate, again, I would side here with Mr. Fouché. I think if the preceding several decades we had overarching Eurocentric uh, kind of strategy in terms of economic alliances, uh, in terms of um, in terms of the vision of how things are to develop. I think China is certainly seen as far more successful in terms of its transition path, um, and to some degree, I think it's only inevitable that. Um, this model will attract uh, the attention of Russian policymakers, as will some of the other successful models in East Asia. Uh, one of the examples that um, uh, President Putin likes to, uh, I think, cite and cited on many occasions is South Korea. Um, and um, uh, that obviously is a model that was not devoid of certain autocratic uh, elements itself, especially in the obviously in the early stages um, of its development. But clearly, uh, 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 more of a tilt towards Asia, I think, uh, is to be expected. In terms of the components of catch-up, um, if you take uh, the, the macro model of, uh, of any country, capital, labor, productivity, in terms of capital, uh, the key issue that is still unresolved in the preceding decades and that has to be resolved is infrastructure. Um, the issue of industrialization has not been delivered upon uh, so far. Um, and uh, uh, infrastructure is something that uh, allows Russia to deal with the number one curse that has already been mentioned by Mr. Jurgens, which is distance. And the issue of distance is tremendously important and underappreciated by a lot of the uh, economists because if you look at the balance sheets of a lot of the Russian companies that are strenuously competing with their peers from the West, uh, transportation costs tend to be ha far higher in terms of uh, shipping costs uh, from hinterland regions, from the inner region regions of Russia to external markets. And then uh, we go to the second component, uh, which is labor. Uh, and with regard to labor, demographics uh, is um, likely to continue to, imp it was a tremendous shock, obviously, probably one of the largest shocks that Russia experienced in the transition period. Uh, and we're now still experiencing this. The lower growth rates that are exhibited by the Russian economy are partly because we're losing hundreds of thousands of people from the labor force each year. And this is the aftershock of the, of, of the 1990s. Um, in these circumstances, migration will have to remain part of the uh, economic policy package. And the key issue for Russia will be quality rather than uh, uh, quantity. And obviously, in terms of quantity, Russia is currently one of the largest recipients of labor migrants in the world. One issue that I would highlight with regard to um, labor, and it was again mentioned by Mr. Johnston, I think uh, very rightly so, the issue of human capital, I think, and in all of the discussions on the economic strategies of Russia, human capital is uh, being ascribed significant attention. Uh, one, I think, interesting ang angle is generational. Um, any time frame of 20 years that uh, you look at is, is about generations. You look at the transformations in other countries, uh, including Ukraine to some degree probably, and uh, the role of generations um, is clearly to be seen. Um, I think we're starting to see some very interesting signs of this generational shift, including in the upper echelons of power of Russia. Uh, whereby um, you have, for example, the, the new economy minister, uh, Mr. Areshkin, a very capable uh, 
um, policymaker who's uh, risen to heights in, in a matter of several years. And he's recruiting, believe it or not, some of his deputies from Facebook. Um, and uh, social uh, social media. So, in terms of how uh, how the Russian uh, government is uh, starting to operate, um, is uh, is going to be, I think, very different. And this generation um, of the likes of Aryashkin is, I think, a very interesting one that is likely to be uh, quite influential. Um, and the emphasis, actually, in terms of uh, getting new people on board, whether it's the governors or uh, also, the economy ministry headed by Ryashkin is precisely to recruit the young. And finally, with regard to um, productivity, uh, this is probably one of the biggest uh, frustrations and one of the biggest question marks uh, for the future. If you take the past 10 years, uh, first of all, productivity was almost every year consistently below real wage growth, and secondly, uh, if you take the past 10 years, uh, no catch up at all vis-a-vis -vis the West. So where we started from 10 years ago in terms of around 30% uh, level, uh, a third of the U.S. level of productivity, this is roughly uh, the same uh, where we are now. Arguably, uh, there are good things to be said about low base effects that could be exploited by Russia that could provide some upsides. And some of the low base effects that have not been uh, fully exploited so far, I would uh, first and foremost uh, single out economic alliances. So if you look at the number of FTAs secured by Russia, for an average WTO economy, this is, I think, uh, uh, 14, 15. Uh, for Russia, this is one or two. Um, one of the recent ones was Vietnam. Um, obviously, Russia is doing it together with the Eurasian Economic Union, but there are dozens of countries that are waiting in line to uh, forge uh, a free trade area with Russia uh, and its Eurasian partners, uh, diverse partners, potential partners such as Singapore, such as South Korea, which is very keen from what I understand to secure an FTA. Um, other players like Israel, for example, um, and some of these cases are actually near-term goals for uh, the government. So this whole issue of what is called by Russian policymakers new openness, uh, openness that is now based on uh, forging economic alliances across the world, finally after joining the WTO, Russia can pursue a proper uh, trade policy. This is, I think, um, very important. The second uh, issue in terms of low base effects is investment. Russia's growth, if it was staged in the preceding decades, was largely consumption driven. Um, investment, I believe, is likely to be the main driver of economic growth uh, in the coming decades. Uh, and that would, to some degree, allow Russia, uh, if it deals also with some problems like corruption, to address um, the uh, infrastructure. Uh, barrier. Uh, now, uh, in terms of, I, I'm getting uh, pretty much to the end of uh, uh, what I wanted to say. In terms of other resources that could be employed and that could present upside potential to some of the scenarios that we saw from uh, Mr. Uh, Dinkin, I think the experience of 2006 2007 shows that, for example, Russia's uh, resources abroad that are not always readily observed can be a factor. What I'm talking about is the um, capital abroad uh, of Russia, and uh, uh, there could be, you know, judging by the size of the capital outflow in the preceding decades, trillions of, uh, of dollars abroad that could come back if conditions were to improve, and we saw precisely that for brief peri periods of time in 2006, 2007, when Russia experienced relatively significant net capital inflows. Another possible upside potential is the Russian diaspora. Russia has one of the largest um, diasporas in the world. Uh, according to the uh, foreign ministry, it's either third or fourth in the world, and uh, it's probably one of the most high-tech diasporas. Uh, so um, if Russia is capable of um, you know, uh, exploiting some of this potential that is out there abroad, then this would be uh, obviously uh, more of a factor.
in attaining high growth rates. Finally, I want to add, end my uh, intervention with uh, reference to Dostoevsky, who was also mentioned uh, here today already. And uh, believe it or not, his last piece that he wrote in his diary in 1881 was an economic piece um, on Russia's economy uh, where he made predictions, and we all know that uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dostoevsky is great in terms of uh, predictions. And uh, his main message uh, to Russia was the lack of long-term horizons. Um, uh, Short-termism uh, as probably the ultimate most important barrier with regard to economic development that needs to be overcome. And the second issue was trust. The lack of trust uh, mm, undermining really the effectiveness of economic policy. Whatever was said by Dostoevsky uh, significantly more than 100 years ago still remains the case and hopefully some of these issues um, will be finally addressed in the coming several decades. I think there is cause for hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so if we carry on with our nar narrative on uh, bipolarity, no matter in which pole we want to be, democracy or autocracy, we have to do, according to Mr. Lisovolik, with whom I 100% agree, we have to do human capital, investment capital, and technological breakthrough, for which we need a little bit of a more relaxed political climate because those people in the West, about eight million of high-techers, will not come back easily.